I'm Alan Jones, ex-Formula One world champion. You know, it's been 50 years since Sir Jack Brabham became the first Australian ever to win the world driver's title. Sir Jack not only raced the cars, but he built them. And in fact, today remains the only man to have ever clinched the world title driving a car of his own creation. Sir Jack, now in his mid-80s, is a modest hero, now finally getting the recognition in his own country. Tonight, we revisit his story. Jack Brabham was champion driver of the world three times. He was designer, mechanic, team manager and test driver. Australia should feel thoroughly proud of the fact that they've got a genuine international icon in Sir Jack Brabham. He's a true hero, believe me. I honestly think it'd make a great film. There's a young bloke that started out racing midgets on dirt uh, that goes to the very top of international motorsport and dominates Formula One and becomes world champion three times. I mean, that's fairy tale stuff. Sir Jack was the first Australian to come over and really make a mark. I mean, he is, after all, he's one of the best known Australians in the world. I mean, you've got Don Bradman and, and a few other guys, but I mean, not, no, very few people in the world have achieved what he achieved in his sport. Jack was in many ways a pioneer. He was a brilliant engineer. He became the first ever driver to win the world championship in a car carrying his own name. It's always been a bit of a mystery to me that Jack has never had the recognition that I feel that he deserves. What have you been doing? Oh, taking my time. I know how difficult it is to win a world championship in motor racing, believe me, and um, I, I don't think um, the Australian public just realise what a treasure we've got in Jack. Right, off we go then. I first met Jack just after he retired from motor racing and came back to Australia 38 years ago. Jack has had quite a lot of illnesses. The deafness has been a big problem and that was caused by motor racing. My eyesight's going as well. I've got macular degeneration and although I can still see to get around and I can still drive the car a little bit, anywhere where I know the road backwards I can drive. But unfortunately, I can't read the signs. If I went for a long distance run, I'd have to stop and get out of the car to read the signs. I can't read them as I'm going by. I, unfortunately, my health is not all that good at the moment. Morning, everyone. I have a kidney disease, which basically come from my mother because my mother died with kidney disease. Okay, now for some local. Bit of a sting, probably. Mm, I've had that before. Yeah. Three times a week, I've got to go and get hooked up to a dialysis machine, which basically takes the blood out, passes it through a filter, and back into the system again. Red gold. Having had the dialysis, I asked the doctor what the alternative was. Now, is there any alternative? He told me what the alternative was. I didn't like it, and I'm still on the kidney machine. <laughs> Racing has been good to John Arthur Brabham, son of a Sydney green grocer. Even at an early age, there's some evidence that he was fond of fast-moving vehicles. I was the only child, and of course, I think my mother took one look at me and said, no more. <laughs> I'm sure that's what happened. <laughs> I left school and got a job in a garage as a mechanic. I'd done an engineering course, and I only got two years of it done and uh, joined the Air Force as a mechanic. So Jack came out of the Air Force after the war, started in an, an engineering business of his own, buying and selling second-hand cars. And then he started racing. A friend of his introduced him to midget oval racing in Australia. 
So I managed to win the third race I started in and uh, never looked back from there. My first marriage was in 1951 when I married Betty and uh, I had three boys. I'm the oldest uh, son. You know, I used to go to all the races uh, with my dad. I really enjoyed that, you know, especially when you're really small because, you know, jumping in the cars and getting pushed around was kind of a thrill. I eventually got my father to help me buy my first proper racing car, if you like. Jack came over to Europe in 1955. Luckily, I got in tow with um, John Cooper, and um, I had the idea of perhaps we could put a lens in the back of one of these cars, and he gave me the OK to build my own car in the workshop and do what I want. Built, really, the first rear engine racing car, really, of any consequence. Jack Brabham, with Cooper, was responsible for the transformation in Formula One where the engines went from in front of the driver to behind the driver. The cars are now lined up on the grid for the main event. Well, that's the 1958 Melbourne Grand Prix at Albert Park. And as you can see, uh, Sterling Moss is on pole, so Jack's in the middle, and Dad's on the outside in a 250F Maserati. And that little kid there is me. That was the Australian Grand Prix. <laughs> Five seconds to go, three, two, one. Brabham makes an excellent start, followed by Moss and Jones with Gray right on their heels. He was a really tough, tough driver, I'll tell you. Um, I wouldn't say dirty, but he, but he really would push around, you know. At Melford Corner, Moss number seven and Brabham number eight go through while... The... In a word, I would describe Jack Brabham's racing style as forceful. Uh, which is uh, a polite way of putting it. Time, Moss and Brabham are appreciably faster than the rest of the field. Woe betide you if you were behind Jack, if there was an opportunity for him to put a wheel off the circuit and spray stones into your face to put you off your racing line, because Jack, Jack was a hard man on the, on the track. On my first trip across to New Zealand, I met the McLaren family and uh, I was able to use their workshop to work on the car and uh, got to know them very well. And uh, of course, met Bruce, and uh, Bruce was only a young kid at that time. Jack um, enjoyed a wonderful relationship with Bruce's parents to the extent that he looked on them as his New Zealand mother and father, which was great. Bruce got selected for the New Zealand Driver to Europe scheme and Jack was most supportive of that. And I was able to get him into the Cooper team and it was great seeing Bruce doing so well. When Bruce came over, Jack, I think, was very much his mentor and, and took him under his wing. An Antipodes partnership from Australia and from New Zealand. Bruce McLaren must have owed a great deal to Jack. And, and Jack enjoyed it as well, because I think he got a kick out of helping a young driver get started. You always got the feeling that there was almost a father and son relationship there. For Jack Brabham, 1959 was an outstanding year. The international motor racing season starts with the Monaco Grand Prix. Those days, Sterling Moss enjoyed a film star reputation and he was the pre-race favourite. Sterling Moss fails to complete the course and Jack Brabham in the Cooper Climax records his first win in an international Grand Prix. I won my first Grand Prix at Monaco in uh, 1959 and being presented the trophy from uh, Princess Grace, that was a great thrill. And uh, of course, we went on from there and won quite a few races. I actually had a crash in 59 in the Cooper. Not having a seatbelt actually saved me. My car hit the ground upside down and I wasn't in it. And that was a bit of luck. <laughs> By December, Jack Brabham is the leader in the World Drivers' Championship and the United States Grand Prix at Sebring is the final race of the series. Only one other driver, Sterling Moss, has a chance of beating Brabham for the championship. And the interest of the motor world centres on this, the start of the American Grand Prix. 
Brabham is in front of his fellow Cooper driver, Bruce McLaren. Bruce and I led the race for quite some time, right up to the last lap. With only one lap to go, Brabham looks a certain winner. On the last lap, I was leading and Bruce was behind me and uh, sadly my car ran out of petrol about half a mile from the end. And uh, Bruce drew up alongside me and looked at me and managed to say, well, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> I couldn't do anything but just coast to a stop. Brabham was in trouble on the final straight. And I eventually stopped about 100 yards from the finishing line and I started pushing. If anybody assisted me, I'd be disqualified. And Bruce McLaren at 22 is the youngest driver ever to win an international Grand Prix. In an atmosphere of great excitement, Jack Brabham pushes his car across the line in fourth place. At that time, of course, when I pushed the car over the line, I didn't realise uh, what position I was as far as the World Championship was concerned. It was a big thrill to me to find out after I was exhausted on the ground and found out that I'd actually won the championship. It was a fantastic thing. Bruce won the race, and because uh, that really helped launch Bruce into his career. Jack, as far as I know, you ran out of touch on the last one. That's night. right, yeah. What did it feel like at that very moment? Well, it felt terrible, but I knew that my Old mate Bruce was close behind. Now what are they going to say in Australia when they hear this? Or New Zealand, Ronnie? I don't know what they're going to say in Australia, but I think they'll be fairly pleased in New Zealand, Ronnie. What's he going to have to say about it? It looks like we're both very pleased, though. That's all right. I would say probably one of the toughest drivers I ever raced against. Most of the drivers, once you'd pass them, you could forget about them. But uh, Sir Jack, you never knew. I mean, he was he was always always there hunting along. He was competitive. I mean, he wanted to win. In 1960, Jack won the championship again. So he was now a double world champion. And that, of course, really proved to everybody that we had the right idea with the engine in the back. And now, of course, today the cars are all running. Uh, it must have been the right idea, mustn't it? My first wife, well, Betty, of course, was the mother of the three boys I've got. Then eventually, of course, I finished up with a second wife, Margaret, who's uh, with me today, and a great asset to me. It needs to be 10 minutes. I, I never go past six. Both Margaret and I are patrons to the Kidney Health Australia. And we're very proud to be part of it because it's done such a good job for me. Uh, I want it to be really, uh, rubbed off onto other people. Well, these are lovely, aren't they? Mm. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic, yeah. Living on the Gold Coast and having the dialysis has really changed our lifestyle completely. We have a much quieter life now. I still get a fantastic amount of um, fan mail, like so, yeah, nearly all the uh, fan mail comes from overseas and I'd say 50% of it at least from Germany. I'm sure I'm better known overseas than I am in Australia. Jack Campbell, Good evening, how are you? Mayor of uh, it's a strange thing that Jack seems to be more revered in other parts of the world than he is in Australia. Lovely to see you again. When we go overseas, he is swamped, totally swamped. It's like he was a pop star. You have to have a minder. I don't know what you've done, but you look terrific. No. <laughs> There's very little comes from this country. I'm right, very honoured to have this couple in the room. Sir Jack and Lady Margaret Brabham, the triple world champion Formula One driver, Sir Jack and Margaret Brabham. In Jack's day, it was by no means unusual for four or five drivers to be killed every season. The cars were mobile death traps. They didn't have safety belts. And the general attitude then was, the throttle works both ways. It shuts as well as opens. And if you can't take the heat, keep out of the kitchen. The fire in the racing cars was the most dangerous part of racing in those days. They were built with a, a fuel tank, which we sat in. It didn't have much of a crash to have a terrific fire, and that was really dangerous. 
when you reckon that you may get c it doesn't half make it a lot more serious. You know, it's like gambling for chips or gambling for big money. I would say to myself, well, he got killed, but he was doing what he wanted to do. And I'm sure Jack did much the same. I mean, nobody was out there holding a gun to our head saying you've got to race and risk your neck. So you can argue that you needed a lot more courage in those days than you do now. And Jack has certainly never been short of that. Just in the period I was racing, uh, I had at least 30 friends killed uh, in the racing. And um, it, uh, it was just a dreadful error. My dad's attitude towards it, uh, he was always confident in what he did and, and he never um, uh, left home saying, well, I might not see you again or anything like that. I can't say it wasn't a worry, uh, because it was, there's no question about that, but, um, you know, you, you just dealt with it. This is the Brabham Mansion in Surrey, England, where he lives with his wife and children, the epitome of a successful businessman. Jack's always been very astute on the business side in a very quiet sort of way. In fact, Jack Brabham is now the world's largest manufacturer of racing cars. I decided to set up my own team. I brought Ron Torenak across from Australia. He sells between 80 and 100 racing cars a year. And they started building racing cars. Ron Torenak designed them. Jack contributed to the design and the engineering. And Jack raced Brabham cars. Certainly staggered everybody overseas to see an engine come from Australia. The engines are built in Melbourne by Repco and flown to England. And it was fantastic, we cleaned them up. Here in the British Grand Prix at Brands Hatch, it's almost a solo exhibition as he notches up one of his four wins in World Championship races in 1966. I had just as much enjoyment out of um, being the mechanic and looking after and getting the cars to the line as I did out of driving. The driving part was just relaxation after it all happened. <laughs> Motor racing in 1966 was Jack Brabham's year. Here he wins the Dutch Grand Prix and more points towards his world championship. With only three Grand Prix to go, it now seems certain that an Australian driver in an Australian car will carry off the world championship this year. It was a thrill to not only build your own car, but to uh, race it and win races with it, it was terrific the only man ever to win the World Driving Championship in a car of his own design. And now, Brabham the manufacturer is as famous as Brabham the driver. And winning the World Championship in 66 was really the pinnacle of the whole thing because to win the championship on the Australian made engine well, it was a fantastic feather in our cap, I think. Jack receives the club's gold medal for his unique double, the manufacturer's and driver's titles. Three times world champion, it's not a bad effort. Better than mine. <laughs> oh, don't worry, I'm happy to have got one. <laughs> Jack has also been invested with the OBE by the Queen of England during this fantastic year. Mr Callanan, on behalf of the Australia Day Committee, presents Jack with a medallion which honours him as the Australian of the Year. He was the first racing driver to be knighted. I can tell you it put a few English noses out of joint. Success never went to his head. He was never pretentious. He just got on with the job no matter what job was at hand. Jack helped not only myself, but Bruce to such an enormous extent. In Formula One these days, the two top teams are Ferrari. And secondly, and not so very far behind, is McLaren. Now, McLaren obviously was started by New Zealander Bruce McLaren, uh, with whom Jack had a very close friendship. McLaren and Holm ran one, two in their iron Chevrolets for the entire race. Bruce was a fine engineer as well. In many ways, that's why they were so compatible and such good friends. They both thought very much alike. I say, well, yeah, maybe it could be a bit thinner, but uh, maybe it will be a little bit lighter, but uh, 
let's just leave it thick. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, I'm, I'm responsible for that. Jack has told me about the fact that he had a discussion with Bruce, discussing the fact that he might retire from Formula One and just do testing. And Jack had said to Bruce, you know, testing can be just as dangerous as racing. You know, don't think testing is safe, it's not. This had all changed dramatically on June the 2nd, 1970. Bruce was testing a big sports car down at Goodwood. And when it came lunchtime, they decided to go to a little cafe. And when they were walking across, Bruce stopped and decided he wanted to do one more lap in the car so as he could think about it while they're having lunch. He did one lap and they went around and then the guys that were there said it all went quiet. The rear bodywork failed and so the car immediately was out of control. And there was one earth, huge earth bank and sadly that was in the way and the car hit that bank at a massive speed and destroyed itself and so there was no chance of Bruce surviving that. What's it feel like? Here you are. How old are you, Bruce? 22. 22. And you've won a Grand Prix? I'm, I'm about as surprised as you are, I think. <laughs> I didn't expect it, not for one moment. Losing Bruce McCrown actually was probably the biggest thing that uh, um, turned me towards retirement. And um, that really... Uh, uh, was something that really hurt when Bruce McLaren was... And we're expecting a lot of people in during the Grand Prix in a few mm -hmm. weeks' time. Car looks a million dollars, doesn't it? It does. The National Sports Museum is a year old. We've got Sir Jack Brabham's BT19 car. It's our largest item on display. All right, well, let's go over here and have a look at the so Jack hadn't seen some of the trophies because they'd been in storage, so he was delighted to see his Monaco 1959 trophy. Fantastic, cleaned up well, isn't it? Yes, To yes. come here and uh, see the display and the trophies and things, it's absolutely magnificent to do that today. decided to come and see you. Are you right? Yeah, what, what about you? Over? I just, I wanted to just make sure that you were keeping out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? <laughs> yeah, that's a surprise to know you were coming. Surprise, I wanted to man. make your day. It's a very special year because it's 50 years since his win at Monaco, his first true Grand Prix win, and his first world championship in 1959. So I flew over from New Zealand amazing we can remember some of this stuff. I think what it's important for any country to recognise that with these people, they have living treasures. Living treasures. I have learned, and I hope it's wrong, with horror and dismay, that there are no celebrations planned for the fact that it's the 50th anniversary of Jack's great achievement. I can't understand why Australia is doing that. Last weekend, David Brabham drove his father's famous Cooper Climax T51 at Sebring in Florida to commemorate the milestone. I know Jack was very hurt. There was no acknowledgement of his 50th anniversary, not in this country. And yet in America, huge effort was made. And shortly there is to be in England as well. I believe that um, on his 50th anniversary, if they can reenact uh, he pushing his car across the finishing line at Sebring in America, um, surely they can give him the recognition that he deserves. I can tell you driving the Cooper Climax uh, really gave him a thrill. It meant so much to him. He's a very quiet, uh, private person, and he probably would be slightly embarrassed um, at any fuss that was made of him, which is all the more reason we should make a fuss of him. It was only about a week and a half ago, I was thinking, gee, this is Jack's 50th anniversary. We better do something special about this. So a couple of us got together. We hope you'd all like to celebrate. In, uh, and they did a 
beautiful tribute to Jack, which he appreciated so much. I could see him as I caught my eye, and as it was going on, I could see a little tear sort of forming here. And I thought, I think he's pretty touched by all this. I think it really got to him. And that was incredible. They had a fantastic big cake. There's enough for all of us. The two big cakes, what more do we want? <laughs> the um, response was absolutely terrific. You're on the right number this year. Uh, 83. I'm uh, chasing after him for his 83rd. I'm not there quite yet. I just hope he enjoys it. I hope he gets the, the uh, understanding of the people to realise what he did achieve for Australia. Because I think Australia is a, a wonderful country. <laughs> <laughs> Coconut Happy birthday, Thank darling. You. I've just passed my 83rd birthday, uh, but the dialysis has, has kept me going. And uh, I, th I think I can go on for a few more years yet, I hope. To get the gearing right, we've got a couple of axles to try and stuff. The other big problem I've got coming up, <laughs> I've got a grandson uh, who started motor racing, which is really the third generation of the Brabham side. Play with pulling the choke up halfway down the straight and seeing Ever since it. I saw my dad racing and all the videos on the TV and my grandpa's videos and how he won, it just inspired me to just get in the car and kind of take on a racing career, really. So the Brabham name will live again. We will have another Brabham world champion, I'm sure. This is my favorite area. The Tambourine Mountain's fantastic. Because the big aim now is to um, die without an enemy in the world. I'm going to outlive the bastards. 